Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been so we have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. You must go through every single problem in this book. If there is a problem that gives you trouble, you will find the solution to the problems from day number 251 through 400. We are almost done, finished doing all the problems from this book. The problems that appeared in this book are all of them, almost all of them, the same exact problem and in most cases the same exact page numbers as the ones that appeared, fortunately, in the first edition of the revised GRE. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you happen to be interested in looking at the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now, we are doing quantitative comparison questions, quantitative comparison question out of this book here, the 10th edition of the, of the general GRE, the old, old version. Why? Because the other two books that I just showed you, the revised GRE, the first edition and the second edition that they have come out, the ETS, they do not contain, simply do not contain enough practice problem for the quantitative comparison questions. So to get, to, to, to get some extra practice, we started doing some quantitative comparison questions from this book from day number 401. Right now we are on day number 412 and we are on page number 200. Please turn to it, page number 200, problem number 6. Problem number 6 on page number 200, it says Marie, we are told that Marie drove 200 miles in 5 hours using gasoline that cost $1.49 a gallon, $1.49 a gallon. Let's see what they're asking us to compare. Let's see what they're asking us to compare. In column one, they, they want, they, in column one we have Marie's average speed. Well, Mary, Marie's average speed is very simple. She drove 200 miles in five hours. 200 miles in five hours, that's 40 miles per hour. Well, that was quite straightforward. Her average speed in the journey was 40 miles per hour. 40 times five is 200 miles. That was very straightforward. In column B, we have uh, the amount of gas or rather, her gas mileage, or gas mileage during the journey. Now, how do we figure out gas mileage? What do we need to know in order to figure out the gas mileage? If you took a trip, and you, at the end of the trip, you want, you're, you're wondering what was the gas mileage of your car, what two bits of information do you need? Well, first of all, you need to know how many miles you drove. We drove 200 miles. And the second bit of information you need to know is how much gas we burned. How much gas? How much gas was burned? How much gas did we use up? Not how much it cost. The price of the gasoline has no bearing whatsoever. The price of the gasoline has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on the mileage of the car. You, you, your car is going to give the same miles per gallon regardless of whether the gas costs dollar a gallon or one thousand dollars a gallon. So how many miles you get per gallon out of, the, out, out of uh, how many miles you get uh, out of one gallon? It depends on the car. It doesn't depend on the price of the gasoline. This, this information that they give you is superfluous. It's gratuitous. It's unneeded. It's unwanted. It's unrequired. It plays nothing. We need to know how much gas was burned. They don't tell us how much gas was burned. The answer is B. We know this quantity, but we're comparing this quantity with uh, versus a black box. How can we compare this versus unknown? The answer is D. As I said before, as we said before, the, the price of the gasoline is gratuitous. It's unneeded. It's gratuitous. It's unneeded. It's unwanted. It's superfluous. It's unneeded. The price is unneeded. A uh, price is not needed here. What we need is how much was how much gasoline was burned, not the price. The price is gratuitous. It's unneeded. It's unwanted. Unrequired. Uncalled for. It is unwarranted. When did we learned about gratuitous, and I hope I spell it correctly. Day number forty-seven. If you are interested in improving your vocabulary, and I see no reason why you would not, or why you would not be, or why you wouldn't be interested. Just type in GRE vocabulary words, day number 47, and watch the video. 
and you will learn the word gratuitous along with the word superfluous. Let's move on. Enough of the talk. Number six, number seven. Number seven. We are being asked to compare square root of 100 plus 36 versus 16. Versus 16. The square root of 100 plus 36 is the same as square root of 136. And the square root of 136, we know the square root of 144. We know the square root of 144 is 12 because that's what 12 square is. If the square root of 144 is 12, then the square root of 136, we don't know what it is or we don't really care what it is. These questions are not called quantitative computation. These are called quantitative comparison. We simply have to compare this quantity versus that quantity. We really don't care what it is. We, only, we don't really need to compute it. We just need to realize the square root of 136, whatever the hell it is, is less than 12. It's less than 12. So we're comparing some quantity that is less than 12 versus 16. Of course, 16 is bigger. The answer is B. Question number 7 was 74%. The number of people who got it right on the exam was three, almost three quarters of the people got it right. Number eight. Number eight. In number eight, we are told number eight was 71%. We are told that the average, average of 12 and 20 is same as the average of 15 and x, 15 and x, and they want us to compare x versus 16, x versus 16, column A and column B. Let's see what we can do here. Well, so what we're telling us is that we have two numbers, we have two numbers, 12 and 20, 12 and 20, if you want to take their average, that average has to be the same as the average of those two numbers, 15 and x. Now we could actually divide this by 2 and divide that by 2 and equate the 2 and solve for x. We could do all that, but that's not necessary. Do you understand? Here's what you do. If the average of the two numbers is same as the average of those two numbers, then the sum of these two numbers, then the sum of these two numbers has to equal to the sum of those two numbers. It makes perfect sense. If you told that you have uh, two numbers whose average is same as the average of the other two numbers, then the sum of the first two numbers has to be equal to the sum of the other two numbers, because otherwise we would have divided this quantity by two and divided that quantity by two, and that's, that average would have been the same. So dividing this side by two and that side by two really doesn't do anything. The sum of these two numbers has to be the same as the sum of those two numbers. We are interested in figuring out x. If you're interested in figuring out the x, let's get rid of 15. Get, get rid of 15 and subtract 15 from this side and it becomes 5. So there you go, there are your x is, there you go, our x is 5 plus 12, which is 17. Our x is 5 plus 12, which is 17. We're being asked to compare it against 16. The answer is A. The answer is A. Number 9. I always forget to tell you this thing. You have to remind yourself each time, every single time, as soon as I finish setting up the problem, as soon as I, fin I finish setting up the problems, you must pause the video immediately, instinctively, and solve the problem yourself and then compare your work against the work that we do together. You will get more out of it that way. Do you understand? Number nine. For example, number nine that we are about to do, as soon as I finish setting it up, pause the video, solve it yourself. You will have more fun that way. Number nine. Total surface area of a cube, we are told, equals 150. And we are being asked to compare the length of one edge of the cube, length of one edge of the cube, versus 4.5. There is your chance, pause the video, solve the problem, and then compare the work that we're going to do together. Okay, I'll give you two seconds to do, to, to, to do just that. Let's begin. 
we are being we are, we are being told that the total surface area of a cube is 150. The very first thing we need to understand is what does this word mean, surface area? What does surface area mean? Surface area means exactly what it says. Surface area means area on the surface. I cannot I cannot find any cube anywhere, but I did spot a something that will do the job just as well. It is not going to be a cube. A cube, of course you know what a cube is. A cube is a is a three-dimensional square. A cube is nothing but a three-dimensional square where all the sides are equal. All three sides are going to be equal. The length, the width, and the breadth, they're all, they're all going to be equal. What do we call a situation where all three sides are not equal? For example, for example, if you have a rectangle, if you have a rectangle, and if you add one more dimension to it, if you add one more dimension to it, this is this as you can clearly see, this is not a this is not a cube. What do we call this thing? It's a rectangle. It's a three-dimensional rectangle. A three-dimensional rectangle is called rectangular box. You have to know these terminologies. So if they use the word rectangular box in the problem, you have to understand that what they're telling you is that we have a three-dimensional rectangle and not a cube. Three sides are not equal to each other is what they're trying to tell you here. So I cannot spot any cube in, in my site here, but I did find a rectangular box. And here it is, rectangular box. Now let's talk about the surface area. What does surface area mean? When you talk about the surface area of this rectangular box, what does it mean? It means exactly what it says. It means area on the surface. And how do we find the area on the surface? We find the area of this face. This, that, that's what it's called. Each one of them is called a face. Each one of them is called a face. And it has six faces. So we find the area of the top face. We find the area of the bottom face, which are going to be the same. They're going to be equal to each other. We find the area of the front face, which is going to be the same as the area of the rear face. We find the area of the left face, which is going to be the same as the area of the right face. And we add them all up. It has six faces. The difference between this guy, a rectangular box, and a cube is that in a, in a situation in a situation where we have a cube, we are dealing with a picture where all sides are equal. And if all of the sides are equal, each face has the same area. And we are told that the total surface area is 150. Total surface area, we are told, is 150. Cube, cube has six faces. It has six faces. So that implies that the area of one face, area of one face, is going to be 150 divided by 6. 150 divided by 6 uh, is going to be 25. Why 25? Because 100, 100 divided, or, we can, or if you like, we can actually show you how to divide 150 by 6. Yes, you heard me right. I, I did say that. Let me show you how to divide 160, 150 by 6. So let's learn it, shall we? How many 6 and a 1? One has no 6. That 1 goes and joins the 5, becomes 15. How many 6s and 15? 15 has 2 6s. 15 has 2 6s. 2 6s six are 12. The remaining 3 from the 15 goes and joins the 3 and becomes 30. And 30 has 5 6s. There we go. 30 has 5 6s. Of course it's 25 because we know that 100, 100 has 4 25s. 100 has 4 25s. And therefore another 50 will have 2 more 25s. So 150 divided by 6. 150 contains 6 25s. So area of each one phase, area of each one phase is 25. If area of each one phase is 25, and we're dealing with a cube here, not a rectangular box, we are dealing with a cube here. And area of each of the phase is 25. That tells us that each of the sides must be 5. It's a 5 by 5. Each phase is simply 5 by 5. And they're asking us to compare the length of one edge of the cube. Length of one edge of the cube, this is the edge that they're talking about. One edge of the cube, we just found out is 5. So we have 5 versus 4.5, the answer is A. One edge of the cube is the same as saying a side of the cube. They want you to compare the length of one side of the cube versus 4.5. We just found out that each side of the cube has to be 5 because each face has the area of 25 because it's 5 by 5. Do you understand? Let's move on. Number 10. Number 10.
And number 10 was 83%. We have x plus 32y versus 32x plus y. Again, I insist that you pause the video immediately, right now, solve it yourself and compare your work against the work that we'll do together. Okay, I'll give you two seconds to do just that. Get in the habit of doing that every time. Okay, here we go. There are two ways we can go about solving this problem. One is what I would call the classical way, the traditional way, the orthodox way, the algebraic way, the abstract way, through algebra. And the other one is a very straightforward plug-in technique where you just plug in numbers for, for x and y and see what happens. Which way should we do first? We're going to do both ways. I'm going to show you the second way, the algebraic way, just, just for learning purposes. But in the real exam, I recommend that you just plug in numbers. It's quicker, it's faster. So let's plug in numbers, shall we? For example, there are no restrictions on x and y. There are no restrictions on x and y, so x and y can be anything. For example, maybe we're dealing with a situation where x is 1 and perhaps the y is 1000. If x is 1 and y is 1000, then what we have here is 1 plus 32 times 1000 versus 32 times 1 plus 1000. So on this, in this column we have 1032 and here we have 32001. Of course the answer is A. But there is no reason why they could switch. There are no restrictions on x and y. For all we know, for all we know, maybe it is the x that is 1000 and it is the y that is 1. In which case, here we will have 32 times 1000 plus 1. And now that we have the exact opposite situation, the exact reverse situation, uh, the mirror image of it. And now the answer, of course, is B. Because of the fact that there is a conflict, the answer is D. So that was one way of doing it. Now, very quickly, in a matter of few seconds, I'm going to show you here the algebraic way, for whatever it's worth. In case you're curious, 32 plus x plus 32y versus 32x plus y. I see x here, I see x on this, in this column, we see x on this column, let's subtract x from both columns. We subtract x from both columns, this positive x and a negative x drops out, and here we have 32y, and we'll end up with 32, 31x plus a y. We see y on this side, we see y on that side, let's subtract y from both sides. So this positive y and this positive y and negative y will drop out and we'll end up with 31y. I see 31y here and 31x here. We have the same factor of 31 in both columns. Let divide, let's divide both columns by 31. And we end up with y versus x. y versus x. Now, if you want to understand this question intuitively, if you want to understand this question intuitively, that's exactly what's going on here. This was more of a mechanical way of doing this thing. I would like you to develop intuition behind the question. So what's going on here is this. Essentially, what's going on here is this. I'm walking up to you and I'm telling you that I'm holding one hand, one number in my hand here. I'm not showing you what that number is. I'm holding one, one number in my right hand. I'm not showing it to you. And I'm holding another number in my left hand. I'm not showing you the number. I'm not showing you either of those two numbers. And I walk up to you and I ask you which one is bigger? To which your gut reaction would be, what the hell? How the hell do I know which one is bigger? You're not showing me the number. That's exactly what's going on here. I'm not showing you the numbers. We do not know what x and y are. There is no information whatsoever as to what x is and as to what y is. And since we do not know anything at all, since we do not know anything at all about x and y, the answer is D. Maybe they are both equal. Maybe it's the x that is bigger. Maybe it's the y that is bigger. How the hell do we know? We don't. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.